Uh, the feeling was described by uh, people experiencing burnout is like dragging yourself to work. Even the easiest task becomes really difficult. And most people seek help, unfortunately, when they are in the brink uh, of breaking down. You know, when they were last drop of energy. Welcome to the 62nd episode of the Struggling Scientist podcast. We are a podcast by scientists, for scientists, anyone science adjacent, and perhaps even hobbyists. My name is Susanna and I'm here with my co-host Jaron. Hi. Recently, we asked our subscribers about their experience with burnout. And it turns out that 80% of the people who voted either have had a burnout themselves or closely know somebody who had one. We also looked at some Dutch studies that show that here in the Netherlands, almost half of the PhD students suffered from burnout symptoms. So it is high time that we make an episode about burnout and how to recognize symptoms before it is too late. We are talking with Jeff Ted Argetoy, who is a practicing psychologist and PhD student about this important topic. So let's start. Welcome, Jeff Ted. We're so happy to have you on our podcast today. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yes, of course. So before we get started with our fantastic topic, we'd love to know a little bit more about you. Could you introduce yourself to our listeners? Who are you? What is your expertise? Any interesting hobbies? Yeah, sure. Uh, my story started in the beautiful city of Istanbul uh, in Turkey. And I studied psychology there in one of the best uh, departments in the country. Uh, then moved to the Netherlands uh, and got my master's degree in clinical psychology from Leiden University. Uh, there I combined psychotherapy and research alike. And I'm trained in, uh, throughout the years, I'm trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, schema therapy, and EMDR, which is which stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And I have my own practice in Leiden, some of psychology, uh, where I work in with individuals, mainly uh, lots of problems, but most common are anxiety, depression, burnout, and chronic uh, personality patterns. Um, it's also mainly targeted towards expats because I'm an expat myself. Aside from that, I'm also a fellow PhD student like yourself, uh, Jaren, not anymore. Congratulations, Jaren, by the way. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jaren. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working on the epidemiology of migraine uh, at the Erasmus Medical Center, Rotterdam, uh, where I also, also completed another master's, so my second master's, uh, but this time in epidemiology. Mm -hmm. um, you ask interesting hobbies, right? Yes. Um, I'm a big uh, flight simulation enthusiast. Uh, I think it's fairly common in Netherlands. I'm really interested in aviation in general. Uh, with my free time, I also uh, love to do science communication uh, with my YouTube channel and my podcast. Uh, they are mainly in Turkish. And lastly, I'm a huge Tolkien fan uh, and uh, everything about Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Um, so that's about it, I think. Cool. In including the latest uh, no. Uh, series? No. Aside no, no. <laughs> I had to ask. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's definitely a new one, aviation for a podcast. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, burnout. Um, can you define a little bit for our audience what burnout exactly is? And uh, so it's just that we're all on the same page regarding it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we keep hearing burnout, burnout syndrome. It is uh, a popular term in that sense. Uh, but the definition, the standard definition is, according to the World Health Organization, is, is a syndrome. Burnout is a syndrome uh, which is conceptualized as a result of chronic workplace stress that has not been managed uh, successfully. So basically, there's chronic workplace stress and it's not being uh, successfully managed. Then it results in a syndrome which is called burnout. So burnout has three dimensions. I like to use this definition based on the research uh, because it, I think, gives a clear uh, picture. It has three dimensions. The first is exhaustion. Second, cynicism towards the work. And third, professional inefficacy. So the exhaustion, as the name suggests, feelings of energy depletion. When people in a burnout syndrome, uh, they report very depleted energy, excessive fatigue, even the normal things that they do uh, without getting tired becomes really tiring. The other thing is cynicism. So there's an increased distance between someone's job. Like uh, 
you used to love the, some aspects of the job, but now it's all together. You don't like it. You don't like the places or the people. And the last one is professional uh, inefficacy. So it's different from the uh, exhaustion. It's not a feeling of depletion, but your uh, your work efficacy is reduced. So with the same amount of time, you give a lower output in your in your work. And um, internationally, it's not uh, regarded as a medical diagnosis, medical condition. So it's not a sickness or a disease in that sense, but it's a syndrome. But some countries with their own uh, national guidelines, they can see it as a medical condition, which means a GP can diagnose you and then you can get a sick leave and other uh, things come with medical conditions. Uh, so it's medically medical condition officially in nine countries, uh, Denmark, Estonia, France, Hungary, uh, Latvia, Portugal, Slovakia, Sweden, and Netherlands. So Netherlands in Netherlands is also... Uh, is diagnosable medical condition uh, mm. based on the national guidelines. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know that such a big part of it was also your your work performance, basically going down. Exactly. So it it we shouldn't measure it as the uh, sheer output or the uh, like the rating of the output, but the people person's own feeling uh, that the, the, the their efficacy is reduced with the. Um, same job requires more time or within the same amount of time they give less output mm. okay um so according to a dutch study four in ten phd students suffer from burnout symptoms does this number surprise you or does it sound about right it actually sounds about right because when you say four in uh, every 10 phd students um which is the number also they found i think the same study is the uh, PNN survey. So in 2020, uh, Netherlands PhD Network uh, did a survey among PhD students, which is a large sample size. And 39% of the PhD students in Netherlands report severe symptoms of burnout. Oh. So it's true to say it's almost four in every 10 PhD students. Mm -hmm. And when we compare this to the general working population in the Netherlands, we got the statistics from CBS, which is Statistics Netherlands, like it's the official um, uh, institution. Uh, when they asked uh, burnout symptoms, it is uh, around 17%. Mm -hmm. So it's almost double the, uh, the number of the general population. That means very high. Of course, there's this methodological thing. They can use different questions and different methods to ask about burnout. So neither survey, for example, used a validated burnout inventory, which we use in the clinic. Uh, but still, it's safe to say that in academia, it is higher than the general average. Mm. And even lower in academia, um, lower than academia in the general population, like 17%, that still means in 2021, 1.3 million working people in the Netherlands struggled with the burnout symptoms when we use the 17%. And uh, one interesting thing when I was <clears throat> checking the statistics Netherlands, um, in 2021, actually, in the last seven years, when you look at, at the graphics, uh, the burnout symptoms and workload, reported workload, caught each other. So which means, the, although the workload was more or less the same over the years, burnout symptoms were lower in mm -hmm. 2014, for example. But the, when we ar arrive, uh, like the, today, around 2018, the burnout symptoms caught up with the workload and after that stays parallel. So higher the workload, higher the burnout symptoms. So mm. you may ask why it was lower before, <laughs> probably because it wasn't known and it was a taboo to say that you have mm. a burnout. So over the time, we have this mental well-being revolution going on around the world and um Probably, uh, it's my own opinion, but probably it become more easier to report and people were more aware. So it caught up with the workload. And after that, we saw during 2020, the workload dropped, reports workload dropped, and as exactly the burnout symptoms dropped. So we know higher the workload goes, it's higher, and lower, it goes lower. Oh. Okay. Uh, that then leads me to a question that I want to follow up on with uh, what regards to what you just said, actually. So do you think then 
perhaps in academia, we're also a bit more aware of burnout and burnout symptoms, then that might also play a role in the 40%, like the 4 in 10 PhD students um, reporting symptoms of burnout. That maybe we're just a bit more aware of it than the general population as well. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say like a nice interpretation. Uh, it could very well be the issue, uh, like the not an issue, but more realistic mm. uh, uh, representation of the sample. Because when you think about the PhD students, they are highly educated, highly educated than the general working population. So they may have heard about it. Maybe uh, it's also very, fairly common if they have a colleague who experiences, so they know more. Mm. Uh, but there's also this um, this surveillance bias, what we call is uh, when you ask a survey, the people who are answering is a form of selection bias, but like when people answering, usually the people with the uh, complaints or they want something to change. So probably the people who answered uh, are the all already ones with the burnout symptoms. That's why they answered, we can say that. But still the difference is too high to explain with these mm. factors. So. We know, we, we are not sure how high is it in academia, but it's, it's higher than mm -hmm. the general population, we can say that. Okay. So I think it's pretty safe to say, indeed, that uh, burnout is quite prevalent in academia. Yeah. But how can, it, how can burnout impact a PhD student's productivity or mental health or overall well-being? Yeah, so uh, it's a fairly large question. So we can answer this also looking back to the three dimensions, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Imagine uh, you're a PhD student. It's not difficult for you guys, but like no. <laughs> people who listen. <laughs> so imagine yourself, your work is already a heavy mental work, right? It's, it's already heavy. You are hypothesizing, reading a lot, thinking. Basically, your job is to think very hard. And sometimes there's also physical aspects like data collection, working in the lab for long hours, looking at the screens. So there's also that part of the exhaustion. And Imagine you're really exhausted and uh, you don't find the energy to even leave the bed in the work days when there's work and you become so inefficient. So the same amount of uh, effort results in very low amount of work. So you still have work to do. And on top of that, you're also distant. So your motivation that like part of the motivation is because we love the work we do that love is gone. Now you're opposite. You don't like it at all. You're very distant about it. You question the work, the thesis, the topic, whatever. So it's the worst thing for the productivity. It's just like shuts down to productivity. Mm -hmm. uh, the feeling was described by uh, people experiencing burnout is like dragging yourself to work. Even the easiest task becomes really difficult. And most people seek help, unfortunately, when they are in the brink uh, of breaking down, you know, when there were last drop of energy, imagine like your phone is 100, like 1% uh, mm -hmm. over 100. So it's exactly like that, actually. Uh, so burnout or battery drained, I, I used to call it like battery drained. Mm -hmm. So aside from the productivity, uh, that's the effect on productivity, but uh, there's a bi-directional link with mental health conditions. So what I mean by this, uh, burnout can affect mental health conditions, but existing mental health conditions can also negatively affect burnout. So, uh, which means if you already had depression, for example, it increases the chances of getting burnout in a high workload environment or a toxic environment. Uh, but if you had burnout first, then it's also increased chance for your depression, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so there is this, when I'm telling you, there's this vicious circle, maybe you, you also realized, uh, you're exhausted, you don't want to do the work, but work is there, and more you wait, it's like procrastination, more you wait, there's this, it grows bigger. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there comes the uh, anxiety for the future about the job security and everything. So uh, to get out of this, usually the onus, the responsibility is put on the individual, right? So if you feel burnout, you should do something to prevent it. You should deal with it yourself. So, but it is kind of telling the phone, you have 1% of battery, help yourself, yeah. plug yourself <laughs> into the charger, something like that. So there's this vicious circle, which becomes this very difficult. So what I uh, recommend generally, we will talk about it maybe in the 
another question deeply, but in general, what I recommend is to early detection and do try to do something about it together with other people, not alone, together with other people as early as possible. Because when you reach that breaking point, it is more difficult to come back. It's not impossible, but more difficult, becomes more difficult to come back. Yeah. So um, talking about early detection, um, can you perhaps give some insights into common signs or symptoms of burnout that researchers and academics should be aware of in themselves, but maybe also in their colleagues? Yeah, that's very, very important, actually. So the research shows uh, lots of symptoms, lots of signs. Uh, we can divide them into physical and uh, mental symptoms. Uh, but there is this debate, I must say. There, is, These uh, symptoms can sometimes come before the burnout. So we can think of them as signs, early signs. But can sometimes they can also be a result of the burnout when you're already in burnt out. So it's not fully understood which comes first. But in any case, it's nice to know those. So physical symptoms are basically gastrointestinal problems, high blood pressure, uh, reduced immune function, so getting sick easily, uh, more easier, uh, recurrent headaches, and sleep issues, either oversleeping or insomnia, sleep, less sleeping. These are mainly the physical conditions and mental uh, conditions, mental symptoms or signs, concentration issues, depressed mood, and feeling worthless, which is really, really common because imagine, just remember the scenario that I was telling, you would feel what's my function here? Like I'm not doing my, I'm not, I'm not able to do it, like feeling worthless and loss of interest uh, or loss of pleasure from the activities that's usually uh, pleasurable to you, usually interesting to you. And in some extreme cases, suicidal ideation. So thinking of death or uh, committing a suicide. I must say here in Netherlands, if you're listening and if you have suicidal ideation, you must call 113, the phone number, or you can go to the website 113.nl and they have also English web page. So this is very important. If you have yourself or someone with a suicidal ideation, please uh, use this number. That's really important. So how to spot it is not clear cut. Uh, there is no way to early uh, detection of the burnout for people around you or yourself. But we can go back to definition. The root, main root, is the chronic workplace stress. So if you be careful about the chronic workplace stress in the environment you're in, or the people, if they experience chronically stressed, a colleague chronically stressed, or yourself, this, this can be a good sign that it can lead to burnout. Um, it's a... Uh, we know that an unresolved chronic workplace stress for a long time, like chronic, can lead to burnout. So uh, it could be, some people even say it could be the last reaction, last resort reaction to this stress, actually. Mm -hmm. So first and very logical thing is try to reduce or remove altogether this stress. But I want to stress something, uh, emphasize something is the difference between chronic stress and burnout. Because Sometimes they are confused and it's really important to know this. The difference is when you're in stress, you're fully committed because you're in fight or flight mode and you want to try to meet the deadline, do the things, bam, bam, bam. But in burnout situation, or if, if you're in the burnout spectrum or syndrome, you barely commit. It doesn't matter anymore. Hmm. Uh, in a stress situation, you're full of energy, but in burnout, again, exhausted, devoid of the energy. In the stress situation, emotions are usually amplified, like anxiety, what's going to happen? I, I have to do this or anger or other kinds of emotions or happiness. But burnout, usually the emotions are dulled. So they are lowered and then more uh, mutt in a sense. And uh, in terms of uh, autonomy, you're on top of your work when you're stressed. You know, when we, when we know about the good stress, even the chronic stress, you're really committed and on top of your work. But in burnout, you're more or less feeling hopeless. So it's more active in the stress and inactive in the burnout. Uh, one important thing is you fear the potential consequences of a bad performance in the chronic stress mode. But when you started to reach the burnout, this is very uh, good differentiation, I think. You're no longer aware or care about the consequences, mm. uh, you know, you're more of the existential anxiety part, like uh, who I am, my life is pointless, what am I doing with this job? This cynicism part kicks in. 
And so basically in the in the chronic stress mode, it's really hard to si detect the sign in a colleague because they may seem from the outside, they are doing perfect. They are on mm. top of their work. You wouldn't seem there's something wrong. But sustained mode, sustained chronic stress mode will lead to burnout for mm. How soon is different uh, on the different factors, depend on different factors, but it will lead to burnout cases. I do think for, from like the environment that, of course, we also did our PhD thing, uh, PhDs in, I think it's pretty difficult to avoid chronic like, stress mode <laughs> because just of the nature of what a PhD is, there is either a presentation or an experiment or a paper or like there's always, there's always stress, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I can definitely see that that might increase the chances of... Um, Exactly. Some sort of stress is not bad, mm -hmm. we know. And there's this great uh, TED uh, video, I think Nancy McWilliams makes stress your friend and based on research, the stress reappraisal. Uh, so appraising stress, something as good, but the stress comes and goes. So you're mm -hmm. stressed before a presentation or during a presentation, but it has to go and you become to normal uh, nervous system. But if you're already always on that fight or flight mode, always chronic stress mode that depletes mm. uh, yeah. your energy levels. Mm. Yeah, and I think definitely at the end of the PhD that that is what does happen. <laughs> that it's, at some point yeah. it becomes just too much, and that's also where it becomes hard. <laughs> yeah, weird. <laughs> 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 you know, I was also thinking that um, with it's also just harder to detect in during your PhD, right? Because you're stressed. Other PhD students around you are also stressed. So who's stressed enough that it might go into burnout it's it's sort of hard because your baseline is already set so high i guess for stress and i think i know for myself for example i wouldn't if someone asked me how your pg is going it's like fine you know it's, I have a lot to do but it's fine um so i think it's also just the the environment that we're sort of in where it's just like yeah no everyone's stressed so that's just normal it's normalized stress i guess um you know. yeah. um so maybe moving on then to our next question. So what unique challenges do you think academics face during their academic journey that contribute to their increased, uh, increased rate of burnout? Yeah, so uh, this will, I think the answer will connect really well with what you just said. It is mm -hmm. normalized there. So I will first tell you about the general risk factors. So general mm -hmm. factors that increase the risk of being burnout, regardless of academia mm -hmm. or whatever workplace, okay? And when I'm enumerating, listing these, I want you to check if they sound familiar, okay, in academic environment. First, unmanageable workload, mm -hmm. lack of control over decisions, insufficient reward, lack of community, unfairness, and some personality factors such as perfectionism. Does that sound familiar in academia? Yeah, I just think community is dependent on what group you are. There can be a really nice community. Exactly. Which then also helps a lot. But the other That's ones, the... yes, definitely. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> the workload is, uh, it's unmanageable, but mm. it is subjective, right? So and un if, if a colleague manages it really well or seems to manage it really well, uh, as Jaren said, you have the pressure. Okay, then it's okay, normal. Then mm. this stress is normal. But we are all different human beings. We are all unique in our sense. We have different strengths, different weaknesses. You know, we, are, we have vulnerability. No one is perfect. So, uh, and we only we ourselves know ourselves as a whole, like inside and out. But we only see the outside of other people. You know, so the unmanageable workload is totally subjective. If it's unmanageable to you, uh, you know this. Uh, you can tell this by some people, some PhD colleagues complaining a lot. You can you can see that. Okay, this is the stressful environment, but this person having a difficult time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so you can also see that lack of control. Of course, you have control over the studies you do, the decisions you make. Ultimately, you want to be an independent researcher at the end of PhD. That's the idea, but. Because the funding usually doesn't belong to you, the decisions are made by others, co-authors, consortia. Yeah. So this lack of control also contributes. Insufficient reward is, we shouldn't just think this as a monetary reward, which is in, good in terms of other countries because in Netherlands it's like an employ, employed job, like it's a paid job. Uh, but still, 
the insufficient reward could be just acknowledgement, just recognition, you know, uh, just congratulations about the small achievement. So if there is less reward, we are less motivated. So it contributes to cynicism. Lack of community, as Susanna said, like if you have a really good group, group of colleagues, it, it's really protective research shows. But sometimes uh, because of the topic you, to you work or if there's a competition uh, in, the, in the group or in the department, so it can be really also a risk factor. So yeah. unfairness is different than insufficient reward. Unfairness is perceived unfairness. So if you yourself and a colleague publish a paper and people react differently, so you do the same thing, but the other person is rewarded more, that's the unfairness, or mm. you you have extra difficulties than the other person for doing the same job. So it's it's more or less that perceived unfairness. Uh, the unique challenges of academic system, I can boil it down also to job insecurity and high expectations. When we just say what's unique about academia than other uh, workplace environments, uh, I can say this. So I also give trainings to organizations and academic departments and in one of them, after I gave the training on burnout, uh, one of the higher faculty members, like a, uh, I think, associate professor, uh, told me that he just realized after listening to me, he's having burnout, actually. He wasn't aware, uh, but probably cannot do anything about it because mm -hmm. there's two reasons. One, admitting it to, to the students or colleagues change how they look upon him. So the reputation is at stake, unfortunately. And the second is he cannot take time off, which is the perfect best remedy, recovery from work, uh, because so many people depended on him. If he, if he leaves his PhD students and the projects will stop. So uh, I want to stress with this example, I guess, is burnout is a problem at every level. So we talk about the PhD experience because it's mm -hmm. the most common, but we shouldn't forget, and people, maybe some PIs are listening to us, this is a unique challenge of academia, and it's there every level, postdoc level, professor level, uh, PhD level. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, how do you think academic institutions and perhaps also supervisors can help play a role in supporting students or also at the higher levels um, of the mental health and well-being to prevent burnout? Yeah, so... Uh... From the things we talked about, it's also evident that uh, it's not just individual problem, right? It's not individual factors, but maybe uh, more than half is organizational factors, like the environmental factors. So I, when I was also looking for the statistics, the cost for the institutions and supervisors is actually enormous. It's big. So, but some still ignores the reality of burnout, unfortunately, as an organization or as the supervisor. So in 2021, the, according to same uh, statistics, Netherlands uh, survey, the biggest reason for workplace absenteeism, which was around four in every 10 absenteeism, so four in every 10 reason was workload or work stress. And this cost each year in Netherlands, 3.1 billion euros in total. <laughs> so it's a high cost, high monetary cost there. And which translates also like the reduced efficacy, right? Like reduced work output. Uh, it's really bad for the research team, the papers that they publish, the fundings they get, but also the universities and other things. Because now people, when they select institutions, they ask each other. There are comments. And then more stories of burnout or this kind of things they heard, they may be missing out highly talented applicants mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. altogether. So there's also this risk. There's a really great study, which I will also give the references, is a systematic review on the impact of academia, working in academia on mental health altogether. And it's published in PLOS One uh, journal. There is this quote uh, that the researchers concluded, and I read from the quote, to improve researchers' well-being at work, scientific or academic practice, and the system's concept of what a successful researcher should look like needs to change. So a quick answer for this, we need to change that definition. We need to change the successful researcher definition from no matter what happens, they go through, they bam, 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 go through the chronic stress, 
they do, they work uh, in the weekend. Wow, what what dedicated pe- person mm-hmm. work on the holiday, you know, always finishes on time, never ask for a deadline, never fails, you know, always ask critical questions. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, publishes a lot, gains funding. We should, I think, change this successful researcher definition. Mm-hmm. I think what organizations and PIs can do in their level Research shows that if they give access to peer support groups, could be other people experiencing burnout or other mental well-being problems. That's really good. Opportunities for career progression. So this, remember, the job insecurity is a big factor. So if there's help in that, just like mentorship, is really helpful for reducing the uh, burnout cases. And what advice would you give to academics who are feeling overwhelmed or on the verge of burnout? Um, I think, uh, this is really important. So the, first of all, one thing they should know if they're listening now, or somebody will tell what they heard in this podcast is, uh, that you're not alone. Mm. Like uh, four uh, in every 10 PhD students experience these symptoms. And what you're going through is objectively difficult. It's not because you're weak or anything. It's a syndrome. It's a medical condition. Uh, first thing I would recommend is with the energy they have left, if they have checked resources in the university, in the department, are there any confidential counselors or better? Are there any psychologists, psychotherapists that they can go to? Uh, and the other thing, talk with their supervisors, maybe daily supervisor, maybe their promoter, how much, to what extent they feel comfortable about disclosing But maybe they can say, oh, I'm stressed. This is too much for me without telling about the burnout. But uh, you can try to make changes uh, about uh, this, maybe lowering the workload, maybe selecting the parts of the job that you like more for a short time, maybe taking some vacation days off uh, just to reset and uh, rest. The other option is if they don't work, don't wait too long, contact your GP, contact your general practitioner. That's the first point of contact. They will be the person to judge about the burnout, and possibly they can refer to you, refer to you to a psychotherapist with the referral. Uh, then you can find a psychotherapist working on burnout, which is the best thing to do individually. And uh, after that, probably with your therapist, you will make up a plan to make some changes, to make some uh, steps, uh, which will include how to talk with your PI, uh, like a concrete plan. Maybe you will rehearse it or what to do organizationally. And the effective psychotherapies for burnout, according to research, I, I'm just saying this, so maybe when you're looking for a therapist, you can check if they're using these methods. The first is cognitive behavioral therapy, then the acceptance and commitment therapy, then EMDR, and then mindfulness-based stress reduction therapies. These are all uh, effective uh, treatments. But okay. uh, according to research, in general, what should we do to prevent? The burnout. This is this is at the this is what to do when they are when you're on the verge, right? But before it happens, uh, research of three categories: one, dealing with the diminished resources. So your energy, your time, your concentration. These are diminished resources. What you can do: take more breaks, take more frequent breaks than normal. Treat yourself as having a flu. You know, it, it's not that different in that sense. So recovery from work, rest more. Uh, some light exercise are is really helpful. All research points out the same thing. Eating a balanced diet, trying to good sleep hygiene, good sleep. And most importantly, which I see that doesn't happen usually, asking for help. You know, confiding with someone you trust and naming it maybe a burnout or a close to burnout, similar to burnout is better than what's wrong with me? Am mm. I weak? You know, I'm in the behind. It's, it gives an explanation. It gives a label sometimes. Sometimes helpful. And the second thing is changing the job characteristic. As I said, maybe uh, you can change. You can, if you know the part giving you the chronic stress, you can try to reduce it temporarily when talking with your colleagues or your PI. For example, if writing gives you really stress, chronic stress, you can focus on experiments for some time. Mm. Supportive colleagues, as we talked about it, and delegating tasks. Sometimes some tasks are not only need to be done by you. So you can delegate them to reduce your workload. And the last one, inter-role management, in that, that they say in the research, is 
working on the work-life boundary. So when the work ends, when the life starts, uh, when these are a bit blurred, so working in the evenings, working in the uh, weekends, on holiday, or talking about work in your private life too much, these are signs of blurred boundaries. So if the boundaries are set better, it will help. And usually uh, burnout can be, I don't say it, co- I can't say it's causes, but it's a correlate, let's say. It's correlated with conflict with others, either colleagues or PIs. So this resolution of these conflicts are really important. Usually an ongoing conflict, ongoing, you know, cold waves, cold winds with like uh, problems with co-authors or PIs, it's really problematic because that gives chronic stress. Mm-hmm. So also managing these is really important to prevent the burnout. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for talking with us about this very important topic. We really loved having you on our podcast today. Um, if people would like to find you or follow you, where can they best do so? Uh, yeah, if they w- would like to follow me as a person, they can check my Instagram page, uh, which is uh, like PSY, psychologist, like sai.jevdet.ajarsoy. And if they are contacting me for psychotherapy or trainings, they can just check jevdet.ajarsoy.com, which is my website, and they can find it. And thanks again uh, for giving me this opportunity. I hope it will be uh, this 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 podcast will be uh, helpful for the people. I'm sure it will be. Okay, and then for our listeners, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, you can reach us via our website, thestrugglingscientist.com, uh, and you can also check out our website for some really cool science-inspired merch and to sign up for our awesome journal of the struggling scientist, aka our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, episode, then leave us a rating on your favorite podcast listening platform as it helps us grow and we're now also available on YouTube. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. Jadon, which ones are those again? Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also YouTube, as you mentioned. Yes. Thank you so much for listening and we hope to see you again next time. Bye. Bye.